Acquiring cards is the fun part, the thrill of the hunt and all that. But remembering how you acquired your cards is a bit like your browser with 266 tabs open, accompanied by the lies you tell yourself about going back and reading them all. And then your computer crashes. Best to document them while you can still remember. So here's some more random pickups from random places. The value of a local card shop really thrives after you've developed a relationship with them. If they're good, they'll keep an eye out for you and let you know when they come across stuff you collect. And that's how Mickey Doolin here made his way to me. On a random afternoon in March, Facebook Messenger pinged a brief note from a local card shop letting me know they bought a collection that had some T205 fillies in it. My interest peaked. I stopped by after work on an unsuspecting Tuesday afternoon to discover this 1911 T205 gold border Piedmont back, Mickey Doolin. Doolin played for the Phillies for nine seasons, from 1905 to 1913. His bat was average, but he was a vacuum at shortstop, leading the league in putouts multiple times, and twice finishing in the top ten for MVP. This card is actually an error but not with the same cachet as the famous Sherry McGee error. His last name, Doolin, is spelled D-O-O-L-I-N, but here it is spelled with an A, which is funny because that's a signature, right? Nope, they faked that too. But since everyone involved in making this card has been dead for a century, I'll forgive them. Mickey Doolin gets me to the halfway point on my T205 team set. Welcome, Mickey. Grab a drink and enjoy the party. One of the harder cards for me to find of late was this 2009 Topps update, Pedro Martinez. Sure, he's mostly known for his time with the Red Sox, but he finished his career pitching half a season with the Phillies in 2009, going all the way with them to the World Series. I'm not sure what it is about this card, but just look at these prices. For years, it was the one card I didn't have for my 2009 team set, and only because I simply refused to pay $20 for it. This card should be a buck. And so I waited and waited. A saved search function on eBay sent me years worth of notifications that yet another card had been listed for $20 and above. I held my ground. And just like that, one random day in February, eBay pinged me, and there it was. 2009 Tops Update, Pedro Martinez, card UH93. For one dollar. I bought it immediately, wallowing in my own crapulence. Patience wins the collecting game yet again. Welcome, Pedro. It was only half a season, but it was very exciting to see you in the pinstripes. Help yourself to the buffet and make yourself comfortable. I'm glad you're here. In my other life that I never talk about here, I work in higher education. During Faculty Appreciation Week, it is common for students to bring token gifts to their professors, like a cup of coffee or homemade cookies and the like. This year's Faculty Appreciation Week blew me away. A student who was in my class for the first time hung out after a lecture one day and had a small gift wrapped in a red bow. It felt heavy for its size. Opening it, expecting a handmade trinket of some kind, revealed a small stack of baseball cards, all fillies. I should add here that I am a very private person and do not have any social media connection to my students. This student had to dig and dig through mountains of internet, but eventually stumbled across one of my baseball card videos that I had accidentally shared from a personal account with the audience set to public. They discovered this channel, and then with no knowledge of cards, set out to assemble this gift. They were great cards, too. In the little stack was a variety of cards, including some 2024 parallels and inserts, some top stadium club, some 1994 Conlon sporting news reprints, and a couple of die cuts. What a cool gift. I mentioned back in episode 20, gifts don't need to be quarantined to a birthday or a holiday. They don't need to be expensive or valuable at all, and they don't need to be wrapped. 
A gift without reason, expectation, or explanation can have the most impact on those receiving it. This gift was one of the most thoughtful I'd ever received. Someone who went way out of their way to find out what I was into. The cards are secondary to the genuine attempt at connection, a trait sorely lacking in our society today, and a gesture very much appreciated by this hardened soul. Speaking of connection, not too long ago, a viewer of this channel reached out about a card. We emailed a bit, and when I was sure they weren't going to attempt to harvest my organs, I sent them my address. A short time later, a small envelope arrived with a nice handwritten message. Among the few cards included was this 2019 Topps Heritage Pat Neshek card, and it was autographed. If you're a fan of this channel, you might remember the love letter I wrote to this card back in episode 19. Check it out for the full backstory. Suffice it to say that I really love that card, and a viewer had this card in their collection and felt that I would love it more than they did. So thank you, Mr. Archer. Small acts of kindness like yours keep this soiled world stitched together. Pat here will be loved and appreciated. Welcome, Pat. Your humor will keep this party going for years to come. Sometimes there's that antique store that you've driven past 800 times before, and for whatever reason you decide one day to stop and see if they have any cards. I did just that in a little town on the day of the total solar eclipse. In a case full of trading cards and other sports-related bric-a-brac was a small pile of vintage cards that coughed up these two from the 1939 Gum Inc. play ball set. After I completed the 33 Gaudi team set, as chronicled back in episode 34, I've been focusing my collecting on the T205s and the 39 through 41 play balls. Encountering 39 play ball Phillies cards in such a small out of the way store was as rare as the eclipse we witnessed that day. Gilbert Brack, card 127, had the nickname of Gibby. Gibby Brack came to the Phillies in 1938 from the Brooklyn Dodgers, and as it turns out, he lied about his age, claiming he was five years younger than he was, hoping it would extend his career. It did not. 1939 was the last year he played baseball, and he would later take his own life. Arthur Whitney, card number 39, was nicknamed Pinky, not to be confused with Pinky May, who also played with the Phillies during this era. Pinky Whitney played for the Phillies from 1928 to 1933, and again from 1936 to 1939. He was an all-star in 36, and he hit 341 in 37, and ultimately was a solid all-around ball player during his career. Welcome to you both, Pinky and Gibby. You gave the country something to cheer about during the Great Depression, and so you'll be celebrated here. Finally, a little crow to eat. Back in episode 32, I went on a bit of a rant about the inclusion of Cal Stevenson in the 2023 Topps Chrome Update and Heritage High Number series. Although I am vehemently opposed to such card manufacturer nonsense, and although Cal Stevenson has still yet to play for the Phillies or even been placed on the active roster, I now own this card. In my defense, I didn't buy it. One of my friends saw my video and mailed it to me as an April Fool's joke. April Fool's, indeed. Not only did it make me laugh, but now I had to own up to owning it. Welcome, Cal. Though you shouldn't exist, here you are. If Mike Sandlock and Tom Casagrande are in my album despite also having never been on the team, well then so should you. Anytime we can replace hypocrisy in our life with consistency, we better ourselves and those around us. And that right, soon. Thanks for watching. Random pickups just can't be ignored. We'll see you next time on Baseball Card Stories, Legends, 